I'm Fernando Guerra, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University and moderator of the Center's Urban Lecture Series. This year marks the culmination of several important events for our city. In addition to this being the 10th annual lecture series the Center has organized, it's also the university's 100th anniversary of serving Los Angeles with its educational experience. Also this year, the city will remember the tragedy of the 1992 riots that occurred 20 years ago. As Angelinos, we should not forget both the physical and emotional scars these disturbances had on our city. For this reason, the Center for the Study of LA is sponsoring a survey of Los Angeles residents and their attitudes and opinions over the last 20 years. This survey will assist our faculty, students, and policymakers to better understand Los Angeles. Since no picture is complete without looking at the past, present, and future, the topic of this year's lecture series is 20 years after the riots, where is LA now? where we hear from the several of the city's current leaders, as well as those running for mayor of Los Angeles in the 2013 election. The series is important for several reasons. It provides an interdisciplinary education to hundreds of students at Loyola Marymount University, and it brings together top government officials, business and community leaders, and students, and the general public to discuss pressing issues facing Los Angeles and solutions to the city's problems. We hope you enjoy today's panel. For more information about the Center for the Study of LA, its research studies, or upcoming panels, please visit our website at www.lmu.edu slash csla. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. Uh, this is the Urban Lecture Series. I am Fernando Guerra, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and the moderator for this lecture series. This is the 100th anniversary of Loyola Marymount University and we're proud to be involved in civic engagement. This is also the 10th year of the Urban Lecture Series. In addition, it's been, it was 20 years ago that we had the riots or disturbances. Um, here to talk about the uh, city that she loves, a native Angelino is uh, Wendy Gruel. Wendy, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be um, back. Yes, she's she's been, she's, she's been a, a, a constant uh, guest uh, here at Loyola Marymount University. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Wendy Gruel. She is a Valley girl, a native of Los Angeles, born and raised. Uh, came over the hill, but not far enough in terms of her education. <laughs> she went to uh, UCLA. Could have kept going another ten miles. Uh, she all, uh, right after uh, graduating, or a little bit after that, she joined uh, Mayor Tom Bradley's office, where she was a liaison for the city council and did all kinds of other activities. After that, she became the uh, House and Urban Development uh, Field Director for Los Angeles under Secretary Henry Cisneros. Uh, after that, she went to the private sector where she did community affairs for um, DreamWorks uh, from 1997 until she ran for uh, city council. And she was elected to the uh, Los Angeles City Council, the second district out in the valley in 2002 in a special election, I believe and then was re-elected. And then in 2009, she was elected citywide as the, I think only the second woman to serve uh, citywide as city controller. And so we are uh, happy to have uh, Wendy Gruel, candidate for mayor of Los Angeles, as one of our guests. And I have two questions right off the bat. Number one, why do you want to be mayor? And then number two, what is a city controller? So let's take the first one. Why do you want to be mayor? Well, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a Valley girl. I, I I'll be okay with that moniker that I grew up here in Los Angeles and grew up in the San Fernando Valley. And I like to say that I'm running for mayor because it's about giving back and moving forward. Everything I am today is because of this wonderful city, because of Los Angeles. My grandfather started a small business 65 years ago in the San Fernando Valley called Frontier because the valley was a new frontier. I had the opportunity to go to public schools, I had the opportunity to have a, a great job when I graduated from college and was able to have some wonderful experiences. And as I look at the city today, we have a lot of challenges, but I also see them as opportunities. And looking at my experience, both inside and outside of government, to be able to hit the ground running, to address the issues that are important, to get our fiscal house in order. And so for me, it's an honor and a privilege to be an elected official. It's an honor and privilege to lead this city and to make sure that we're going down that right path. So do you think LA is going in the right, right direction or wrong direction? 
Well, I think it's going in the right direction because mm -hmm. um, we're not going down, but we need, we're need we slowly making some improvements. We have a, a lot of, of room for improvement on the issues of traffic and education and our fiscal house mm -hmm. as well as making sure we're providing the services to the residents of Los Angeles. Uh, so I'm a gal that thinks things are, the glass is half full, and so I'm looking forward to saying how can we take the great parts of Los Angeles and make them better. How about certain neighborhoods? Well, is the valley in general doing better than the rest of the city, or is the rest of the city doing better, or are they about the same? I'd say they're probably about the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, what we have found, though, is we have you know, high unemployment rate, and we have a, a city that um, people are concerned about providing those basic services. People have said to me, I will, I will vote for you for dog catcher, mayor, president of the United States if you just fix Wilshire Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard, if you just fix the streets and the potholes. I talked to someone the other night who said, I bought pothole insurance. He said, I never thought I'd have to do that in the city of L.A. Um, it's, you know, you think about that in the East Coast, mm -hmm. not here in Los Angeles. So pothole insurance is what? That if your tire pops on a pothole, they'll, they'll replace the tire or That's something? That's right, like and then you will not have to, uh, to pay uh, but that. If you can prove that the city's pothole uh, got you a flat tire, you can actually charge the city. Isn't that correct? You can file a complaint, yes. I'm not suggesting everyone out to do that today, but um, yes. So I think that, you know, when we, we look at the challenges, um, this is an opportunity to say, where, what's our, where's our future? City controller, what is that? <laughs> I like to say that when I was running for office and running for city controller, people had two questions for me. What does a controller do? And then after I described it, they'd say, why would you ever want that job? and I still get that. So the city controller is really the fiscal watchdog for Los Angeles. It's my responsibility to look at auditing mm -hmm. uh, the various departments to see how we do things more effectively and efficiently. I have about 160 employees. I've, I've seen my numbers uh, go down. When I first started uh, two and a half years ago, I had 195. I think last week I looked to have 154 employees. And that's because of budget cuts in your Because of budget cuts, yeah. and I've taken my fair share and been willing to be part of the solution. Um, but I have to say, we're at the bare bones. Mm -hmm. Because not only am I responsible for auditing, but I also do payroll. So I sign everyone's checks in the city of LA. I do vendor payments, I do financial reporting, and I do auditing. So if you become mayor, will you increase the size of the city controller's office? Most definitely. Okay. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, when you look at the numbers, most people think I have this huge auditing staff because what you read in the paper right. is about auditing. But out of my 154 employees, I have 14 auditors. The industry standard is six for every billion dollars in your budget. I should have 42 just looking at the council controlled. If you add proprietary departments, airport, harbor, and DWP, I should have 120. And say I that, have 14. That's because those budgets are so much bigger than the city's budget. Or when you add them, typically the general budget does, inc does not include those departments. Does not include those departments. So. Does not include those departments. So we're kind of a, a lean, mean machine where we're looking at how we use our audits uh, to be a catalyst for change mm -hmm. and to look at things more efficiently. Now, do you get to decide what department you're going to audit or how you're going to um, um, do the audit? Or how, how does that work w when you decide what to audit? Kind of a group process. Um, so my auditors, my civil servants, come to me and say, "Here are several departments that we feel there are risks currently. Either one, they've been audited before, and we don't think they've made many changes. Two, here's some issues that we think um, haven't been audited in several years, some cash issues. And then three, what are some concerns that are of the issues of today? Mm -hmm. And so you'll see, uh, even um, as soon as today, we're looking at the numbers relative to the fire department and right. how they deploy and how quickly they're responding uh, to fires. Uh, so hey, we try to combine to, all this. Explain to the audience and the students what's been happening in the last week regarding the fire department and the data and how they've been uh, presenting that. Uh, well, the mayor and the city council um, a year or so ago um, decided to reduce the fire department's budget and uh, the fire department suggested that there will be minimal impact on their response times to emergencies in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, there was some argument, the uh, UFLAC, the Firefighters Union, said, we think there's going to be big problems with this, and we don't agree. And yeah, the numbers were back You would expect them forth. to say that, because they, they want to protect that. the positions. They want to protect right. the positions. Um, and so what arose this last week was, what are the numbers? How have we diminished uh, the response times from 80% to 60%, or is it from 64 to 62? And there's a lot of debate. My job as a city controller is to just put out the facts and to look and see how we're doing in response. 
So I, uh, the response time we're talking about is, so as a practical case, if I give the midterm back to my student and they get an F and they have a heart attack at that particular moment, how long does it take <laughs> for the department to get here? And, and that, that's, or the paramedics. And, and, and the city average or what you want is how, how long? Well, the national standard uh, that they are basing it on is uh, like five and, and nine minutes are the ones that they look at, depending that's pretty upon good. the so response. So in five to ten minutes, they, they will be here. Yeah. And in 2008, it was 6 to 10. Now again, there's a lot of argument and disagreement about the numbers and so forth. My job, and, and really the important thing, is about accountability and transparency. Put it out there. We shouldn't hide anything about our response. How do we compare with other cities across the country? How do we compare apples and apples um, and not uh, looking at difference? So, you know, my job is to just put out the facts and really ensure that the public knows uh, what is happening relative to our response times. So if there's a standard, let's say, five to ten minutes and the paramedics arrive 15 or 20 minutes, does the patient or the person have a right to put a claim against the city? Well, it's an average, um, and again, we're still looking at these numbers, um, mm -hmm. and it's the five and ten is um, not five to ten minutes, it's five minutes for uh, one kind of response and ten minutes okay. for a separate kind of response. Uh, so we're going to lay that all out um, and be able to, to say that. But again, again, there's a lot of variables, and we just want to make sure that we are transparent about how that's happening, because public safety is the number one issue for the residents of Los Angeles. Let me take you back 20 years ago, April 29th, 1992. The riots, disturbances, whatever you want to call it. Where were you? What do you remember about that? Well, I was working for Tom Bradley then. And I remember that I was in my car with a friend of mine on the way to First Amy Church on the 10 freeway, getting off uh, to go to First Amy Church. Mm -hmm. And the radio, listening to KFWB at the time, uh, said, don't get off the freeways, get back wherever you are, uh, do not go in the streets. And we had gotten to Western and Adams uh, and did a U-turn and went back to City Hall. And I have to say that was probably one of the saddest days uh, of my life. Uh, I was in City Hall, uh, we were watching the TV, it was kind of all hands on deck. Uh, we, you know, they evacuated our building, uh, we saw smoke coming up because they had thrown um, trash cans and fire into the lobby of City Hall. We saw the burning that was happening at the LAPD headquarters around the corner. Um, and, you know, we're escorted that night when I left early in the wee hours of the morning, uh, escorted uh, by the police to the freeway to get home. And then really for the last, the several weeks following that, mm -hmm. I was engaged in what we were going to do for the recovery. So when you think about that, what was the city's response? I mean, do you think it was an adequate response? When, when, when I think about the, the riots or disturbances and how the city responded, I always think that they, um, they established Rebuild LA and then give it its autonomy. Uh, they developed the Community Development Bank. And of course, the major thing, which is mostly what the citizens did, was reform the police department by um, passing, at that time, uh, Charter Amendment F, which cut the terms of the uh, police chief and a couple of other things. And we continue with police reform. But, um, I, I mean, I, as an observer of LA, have always been disappointed about the lack of a systemic city response. And, and certainly you've been involved for the last 20 years heavily. And what else do you think the city should have done? Well, I think it is about structural and systematic change. And, and it exists today. When something happens, people want to create something new. And then when the lights are no longer focused on it, right. um, there isn't the kind of structural change that is important. When you look at the impact, the thousands of businesses that were impacted, the individuals who lost their lives, uh, and the fact that we had huge unemployment. I think soon after the civil disturbance, there was a 37% unemployment in South Los Angeles. Even today, businesses are un uncertain about moving into those areas. Uh, so I think we have to look at, across the city of Los Angeles, how is it that we're going to create jobs and the economy? How is it we're going to make sure that people understand that Los Angeles is a place to invest in? And so the conversations that we're having right now, 20 years later, is what was good and bad and how do you make those improvements? And you have to look back and be critical of things that you weren't able to accomplish. Yeah. So are ethnic groups in Los Angeles, are, are they getting along these days compared to 20 years ago? When you think about intergroup relationships, Latinos and Asians, blacks and Asians, uh, whites and blacks, et cetera, are we better off or about the same or worse off in terms of inter-ethnic relations than 20 years ago? I think we've made progress. We have a long way to go. 
I think that I have participated the other day in uh, Latino and, and, and Jewish uh, organizations and entities getting together to meet with the President of Israel and where there's common themes, where there's my husband's been involved in the African American Jewish Alliance, where there's been Latino and African American sitting together. I think that as I look across the city, people just want to have access. It's the same right. issues, no matter what ethnicity you are. It's about jobs, yeah. and it's about equal opportunity, and it's about education. Is the city safer today than it was 20 years ago? Uh, most definitely. I, mean, I think you look at the numbers, uh, and the chief and the mayor have highlighted them, and that we have the, the lowest crime rate, I think, since the 1950s, 1960s. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've done some, some great things. Is there room for improvement? Always. Um, and uh, I think the critical parts of a leader is to understand that your work is never done. You can't say, oh, just did that, we're going to move on to the next. It is evolving and continuing. We still have a huge gang problem. We still have a huge education problem. And many of the issues in unemployment and others, again, are totally correlated with one another, intertwined. Clearly, what set off the disturbances was the um, uh, jury finding the police officers that beat Rodney King innocent. That was the direct result. But clearly, there was some underlying issues in the, in the city. Uh, many suggest that some of those issues haven't been resolved. Um, from that perspective, uh, or given that, do you think it's likely that we would have another set of riots or disturbances within the next five years? And that would be when, if you are mayor, when you're mayor? <laughs> uh, my, my thought is no, that um, we have made some progress. But again, I'll go back to there's a, a lot of room for improvement. There are still places in South LA and in East LA where you have no access uh, to the kinds of not only restaurants, but food choices, and most importantly, high unemployment rate in those communities. Um, and I think that's a, a key indicator uh, that we have to be able to address. So when you look at have we accomplished much in those 20 years, um, and what is it we're going to do when we go forward, you have to look closely at where are those jobs. And with the demise of the CRA, um, I say this is an opportunity. Yeah. I was not in favor of the demise of the Community the Redevelopment community, Agency. Right. Uh, and uh, the fact that the state said we're going to close them down and take that money to go to the state of California uh, to help balance the budget. Um, I think that uh, now is an opportunity to say how do we have structural change about economic development in the city and making sure we create those jobs in places where they're not likely to move. We don't have a problem with people wanting to move to the west side and create their businesses right. or even some parts of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, but we have to be able to focus attention on getting the jobs in South LA, East LA, in the North Valley. So you worked for Mayor Bradley. Then right after you left that, you were working for HUD and uh, Secretary Henry Cisneros, the former mayor of San Antonio. And so in 1994, we had an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And you were intimately involved. Uh, you saw Mayor Reardon, and, how, and we had Mayor Reardon uh, to speak to the students a, a couple of weeks ago. Compare between uh, you know, 1992, and many of us uh, are very critical as great a mayor as Bradley was, that was not the finest moment for the city or for him. Yet in 94, you know, there, that was, there was a sense that things got done. What's the difference between the, those two? I mean, clearly the events are different, a riot and an earthquake, number one. But the response to, to uh, those two from the two different mayors were also dra dramatically different. I think it's actually the former, which is there are two different events. One was man-made and one was a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. People respond differently to those two um, and how they react. Mm -hmm. I think the other is the, uh, the amount of resources that were provided uh, from the other levels of government for the rebuilding of those areas. Um, I happened, I was working for Henry Cisneros at HUD in Washington, working on national homeless programs, but had come on Friday before the Northridge earthquake to uh, give $20 million for the city of LA for homeless programs in Los Angeles and stayed the weekend and experienced the earthquake on that Monday morning. So it was your fault. Yeah. Right, yeah. that I was here. Um, I've not missed one, so I think that was it. They want to make sure I was here. But I, I think the other comparison um, is between what happened in Katrina and what happened in the city of LA and the Northridge earthquake and how an administration, mm -hmm. a federal government, responded. I had a lot of calls when Katrina happened because I had been quoted in many articles about LA's response. Within a period of time, literally, I got a call from the Secretary's office, Secretary of HUD's office that morning, saying Henry Cisneros is going to be on a plane. He'll be out there by 2 o'clock this afternoon. Can you pick him up? And he was here. The president was here the following day. Mm -hmm. um, being you know, on the ground saying, how do we solve the problems? That was a very unique um, perspective. 
um, going back to the riots, I think the, the challenge there was uh, people said, well, how do we rebuild this? How, where's the money going to be? There was not the same kind of focus and attention. And even, as you may recall, when <coughs> Los Angeles was bidding for an empowerment zone mm -hmm. uh, for this region, they failed. If there was any place, and that was after we left, any place that should have gotten those, mon that, those dollars would have been Los Angeles. But it went to, I think, one of our core problems in LA, which is we expect that everyone is just going to give us whatever we do. We're Los Angeles. We, you know, we have a lot of people who give money to presidential candidates. Yes. We are the biggest, second largest city in the country. We have a huge number of voters. Um, we have great weather, so businesses are going to move here. And guess what? We actually have to compete. And what that application showed was that LA just kind of you know, mailed it in, so to speak, without really looking at how are we going to do things differently. We cannot just do it the same way we've always done it. We cannot do it the status quo. So I think we learned from that, from the civil disturbance and others in the response. So I asked you why you want to be mayor, and kind of repeat the question in a sense, why would you want to be mayor when the position is actually very weak when you compare it to mayor of New York, Bloomberg, or mayor of Chicago? The, those are strong mayor systems. Here we call the one in Los Angeles a weak mayor system because you know, the city council has a tremendous amount of power and can continuously overrule uh, the mayor. Now obviously the mayor has the bully pulpit and can direct the, the, the budget and can direct discussion, but in terms of power, the, there, it, it's, it's very limited. And that structural problem really played itself out right after the riots where the police chief, Daryl Gates, was literally ignoring the mayor, wouldn't listen to the mayor, didn't have to listen to the mayor. He was uh, autonomous, and there was nothing the mayor could do. Today, because of charter reform, the mayor has a little bit more power, but at the end of the day, there's sometimes when general managers and others, the city control, the city attorney, the city council, doesn't have to do what the mayor wants. Um, it's, it, it requires a different skill set than a mayor Bloomberg you know, or the mayor of Chicago would have. What's the skill set required given this structure, this environment that we have in LA to be a good mayor? I think as you've outlined, um, during the times of Tom Bradley when I was there for, for 10 years, compared to today, this, this position of mayor, you have a lot more power than you did then. The general managers responsive to you, the general managers report to you, there are many um, issues or, or, or many, um, I guess, tools that you have that you didn't have when you were Tom Bradley. But there was a difference. I say there's a difference between power that you're given and power that you take. And it's not only about using the bully pulpit, yeah. but it is about being a decisive leader. It means leading and saying, this is what's going to happen. This is, I always you know, use the phrase, say what you're going to do and do what you say. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about building consensus. You sound like a mom. I know. I was just, yes, you know, I have an eight and a half year old, so yes, I am. I talk about boundaries and consequences all the time. To the city I'm, council or to, to your eight year old? No, or the same? The both. Um, <laughs> and in fact, I went in talking this last year on the budget. I said, you know, departments don't have any boundaries and there's no consequences for overspending, for misusing their funds. And the same is if you are uh, the leader, the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, uh, you need to be able to use the bully pulpit to say, here's the vision I want uh, that where we're going, and here's how I'm going to make sure that it happens, that you have the big things and the little things. I learned from Tom Bradley and Henry Cisneros that it matters to focus in on potholes to transportation systems to housing, you know, public safety. I learned from Steven Spielberg that you need to dream, and you have to be able to do both have to be able to uh, look and have that vision and at the same time make sure that we actually implement the, the opportunities that we have, make sure we implement those programs that are going to change people's lives. But if you're mayor, how would you deal Not with... Not if, when, okay, when okay. Excuse me. <laughs> when you are mayor, Thank you. how are you going to deal with a city controller that is as powerful and charismatic as a current city controller and wants to go and do whatever <laughs> she or he wants? Right. How do you put them in, when you set certain policies, you want that, and the controller says, uh-uh, I'm going to audit this, or I'm going to do that, and here's my recommendation, which is counter to yours. I would welcome it, because let me tell you, when I became elected to the city controller's position, I told mayor and city council, embrace change. Embrace the change. Say, Wendy, thank you so much for coming forward and auditing this particular department. You have tools that we don't have, 
and we're going to look at your recommendations, and we probably agree with 90%, and we're going to move forward and implement them. Because the controller does have tools that others don't have. I don't have the power to give myself more money, but there are other tools that I have as a city controller. Uh, so I welcome, and that was another change that occurred during the um, uh, charter amendment, if you may recall, mm -hmm. when they, we changed the charter, they gave the mayor more power. And at the same time, they said, if we're going to give the mayor more power, we need to make sure the controller, that there's someone check and balances. And so it gave me authority for performance, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, performance auditing and mm -hmm being able to do that in the city of Los Angeles. So I am always a, a believer that if you do the job you're elected to do, you can go very far. If you partner with people, even if they disagree with you, and I think that's whether it's an elected official that you're disagreeing with or the public, as long as you are transparent about what you're doing and you have the discussion in public, I'm, I'm all for that. I welcome having a strong controller. We are at Loyola Marymount University having a conversation with City Controller Wendy Gruel, who is a candidate for Mayor of Los Angeles in 2013. The election will be in March of uh, uh, 2013. Currently as controller, you can audit. Can you audit the police department? I can and in, have. <laughs> in general, do you think LAPD is doing an excellent, good, okay job? How are they doing? You know, I guess some days I'd say excellent, some days good, depending upon the activities. I, I do believe that we've seen uh, a reduction in crime all across the city of Los Angeles. I believe that when Chief Bratton came in, uh, and now followed by our, our current chief, Chief Beck, that they have looked at it's not just about enforcement, 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 and making sure that you are um, doing everything on a, a level that um, puts everybody in jail. It's saying, you know what, there's some others. We're going to deal with gang violence. We're going to deal and, and make sure we can try to avoid some of these problems. We're going to work with the community and be their partner. Uh, not like it was, I think, and, and part of the problem uh, during the Rodney King and others, where uh, it was us and them. It's really now about the partnership of dealing with issues. And you need, need to do as much about preventing crime as you do um, making sure that you, you stop that crime and you put those individuals who are breaking the law in jail as well. Charlie Beck, the current police chief, was appointed to a five-year term. His five-year term will end when you are mayor. Um, from what you know right now, would you reappoint him? Most definitely, most definitely. He has been uh, a, a great chief. Again, we have not agreed on everything. We have had a few issues, and uh, we will publicly <coughs> disagree. But I know he is doing what he thinks is best, and I am as well, and he knows um, that he has to lead his police force and make sure that they are not only uh, part of a community, uh, but also ha are held to the highest standard. Um, recently, he's been involved in an issue regarding um, the towing of cars of unlicensed drivers. So obviously, we're talking about undocumented immigrants who cannot get driver's licenses, but they are part of Los Angeles, and they work, and they contribute to the sales tax base, the property tax base, uh, even the income tax. Um, and as they're driving around, they could be pulled over for a broken headlight or something of that nature. The police officer pulls them over. They've done nothing wrong. They have no uh, other than having a broken taillight. Or let's just say they do actually you know, commit a, uh, bio, a movie violation. They get pulled over. They don't have a driver's license. Um, and they impound the car. And it's mandatory that they impound it for 30 days. And typically, the, um, the impound fees and, and the daily storage fees over the 30 days ends up being usually almost as much as the car is worth. So in, in a sense, for committing a violation that many in this audience and many out there do just about every day, not stopping correctly, maybe going a little bit, you know, changing lanes on an intersection. I, have, I don't do any yeah, of that, well, just so you know. But the, the, the punishment for that crime is so outrageous in my mind that you take somebody's car away. None of us would stand for that. Yet for this group, we uh, say it's okay. And uh, what, what do you, obviously you know where I stand on that, but where do you stand on that? Well, look, uh, we're a city of immigrants, um, and I think that when you deal with the issue, whether it's this or Special Order mm -hmm. 40 or the others that talk about it, it's really... Explain uh, Special Order 40. 
Special Order 40 was put into uh, effect by actually uh, Darryl Chief Darrell Gates, yeah. uh, which we were surprised at, yeah. which says you cannot stop someone uh, just based and ask them for their identification based on determining their citizenship right. um, so that you're not discriminating against and going and just picking out people that you want to be able to stop uh, mm -hmm. and to do that. Uh, and that's been in place for a very, very long time. I think the issue that we have to deal with is we want everyone to have insurance, and right. we'd like people to be have some idea that they've taken a test and a driver's right. license. Um, and I don't think most people know, before, prior to 1993, actually, if you were here as an immigrant or whatever your status was, you could still get a driver's right. license. Someone said to me yesterday, there's actually an international driver's license that you can get uh, from going to your consulate. Um, I think or, that... Or triple A. Or triple A, and to get that. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have to not focus in on the, the part of um, whether or not they have this or that or where, what their status is, but rather they have insurance and mm -hmm. can they get a driver's license or some way for identification and have had the appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I think the police commission, and from what I understand in the last one, was trying to find a balance between that and not having someone's vehicle for 30 days mm -hmm. um, and looking at what the state law requires. Um, I think that we want to have people who have driver's licenses and our ability for insurance, and that we have to work on state and local law to allow them to do that. Right. But no matter where they're from. Correct. Um, but part of it is also, you know, it, to, to me, it's the lobbying of the uh, tow truck industry. Um, in, in Los Angeles, uh, the, not anybody can just have a tow truck company and go out there and pick up. You, you have to have a permit and you have to be part of official the official police garage. Official police garage. And basically, you're giving a company a license to make millions of dollars and, and they lobby for that state law. And they lobby for this procedure so they can impound cars, charge a lot of money, keep the cars, and then sell the cars. And the city is complicit by giving this authority to a private sector so they can make millions of dollars. And I just find it unjust and uh, something that, that needs to be uh, dealt with. Yeah, um, and I think that, that I'll get off my soapbox on no, that. No, 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 and I think, just, you know, you're... You, you that are, the city of L.A. is complicit in this purposely is it, just uh, uh, something that uh, uh, gets my ire. I don't know why. No, and, you know, one of the things, as I said earlier, it is about accountability and transparency. I think we need to also know how many, you know, how many cars are we, are we towing that are those for who have no opportunity to be able to have an identification right. um, and where can we deal with the problem? Again, when we talk about immigration, people are focusing in on things that are not necessarily related to the larger picture, which is right. we need immigration reform nationally to ensure that people who do want to come here and work and become, you know, have a path to citizenship. Yeah. Which are um, many, many do. Yeah. So, what does it take to be a good city controller? Understanding the numbers. Mm. Um, it kind of goes to a question someone asked me. What was the biggest surprise you had as the city controller when you came on board? And I said, for me, it was the fact that there were so many people on the city council and others who didn't understand the budget and how it worked and what it meant for cash flow, what it meant for our financial reporting each year, uh, what it meant to understand how you, the sources of revenue that you have in the mm -hmm. city of Los Angeles. So I think it, to be a good city controller, it means being honest and truthful, um, being able to ensure that you are going to just put out the facts there. I mean, mm -hmm. you're gonna, you can have your own opinion, uh, but I've made it very clear. I don't change my civil servants' recommendations. Uh, they come in, they've got, I'll, I'll talk to them, we'll maybe have a discussion about why did you go in that direction, and, and either they'll say, I'll say, that's great, and they'll say, you know, you have a good point, let's work, but I don't, they are very much independent, and I think that's important. So, I think you need to be able to manage, you need to be able to understand the budget of the city of Los Angeles, and you need to understand what it means to do an audit, and to be strong about what you're doing. Yeah. So, obviously, you're running for mayor, so that means you're giving up the position. So, is there anybody you'd like to see become city controller? <laughs> I am not going to do an official endorsement while I'm here on your show tonight, but that was a good try okay, um, just, to be able to do it. that. So, okay. um, but, I, you know, it is interesting. I am the only, two things. One, the only candidate uh, who is giving up my seat to run. Uh, as Fernando knows, that's fairly unusual. Yeah. Most elected officials, either one, they're termed out, or they have a safe ride, which means they don't have to give up their seat to run. So, in other words, she could run for re-election because she's choosing not to. She, right. I think we're at a really important place in the history of Los Angeles. 
to have someone who goes in to that position and understands, as I've indicated before, the big things and the little things um, focusing. I think the other part of it is my experience of now being able to manage a city department, uh, particularly in tough right. times. I still have to get out every two weeks, payroll, I still have to do my financial reporting uh, with whatever staff I have uh, and, and struggle to do that. But I think that is a skill um, that is unique among the candidates. Okay, so you won't tell us who you're going to support for city controller. Let's see if you'll tell us what you're going to, how you're going to vote uh, in November uh, 2012 election. Uh, Governor Brown is proposing an initiative that would increase the tax rate of the wealthy. Are you supporting that? Well, number one, we don't have, I don't have anything yet that's definitely on the ballot. Um, I think there are three proposals going Correct. forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's going to be some uh, coming together of the minds. Uh, because if you have three competing proposals, potentially none of them right. uh, will be. I think for me, um, as we look at that language, it will be looking at where the money's going to go and how it's going to be spent in the state of California is focusing on education. We now are 48th, this state is 48th in the country on per pupil spending. Yes. We used to be fifth. Think about what it means for the future of Los Angeles if you don't have a skilled, educated workforce. Right. Uh, it's very, very important. Uh, so uh, I'm going to look very closely at that uh, and make sure that we have something that's actually, that we can get to pass for the, for the voters and see where the th if the three minds come together, because mm -hmm. there are three different proposals on taxation that would go for education. It also may be likely that on the ballot there may be an extension of Measure R, which is a half-cent sales tax. Not an additional half-cent sales tax, but it would just extend the number of years where they're going to continue to charge that for transportation, mostly for rail, some of it goes back to the city. Would you support that? I think that we have to be able to demonstrate to the public that we're going to spend the money we have and in a good way right now. I think today they're voting in the Senate to allow us to have America's Fast Forward. Yeah. Uh, that would allow us to spend the money more quickly. People are willing to tax themselves, continue a tax, uh, tax on the state level if they believe the money is going for the purpose in which it was intended. That's part of the job of the city controller mm -hmm. is to give confidence that somebody's watching, somebody's looking at how yeah. it, it, it's being spent. Uh, so I, I've been, I was a big proponent of Measure R. Uh, I so was I'll, out there I'll being I'll take touched. that as a yes. Yes. Okay. Um, LA Unified is proposing an initiative that would call for an additional $270 per parcel for their operating costs. It's not a bond measure, but an additional property tax that for on average would be $270. Would you uh, support that? I have not taken a position on that. Uh, but you support education, at, don't you? I do support education. And I, I think, though, it is important as you look, if you're a, if you're a homeowner or a person yeah. who's out there, you want to say, OK, I have five different initiatives on the ballot, each of which is going to be greater taxation. Yeah. Most people say, no way, I can barely meet my obligations right now. Uh, so I think you have to put it in the context of everything. Yes, I support education. People want to make sure, as well, with LAUSD, that their money's going for the right to the right purpose. So there has to be checks and balances. Uh, I haven't read all of the, the language on each of those, but um, I have historically supported uh, you know, m more money for our schools and, and more money uh, for education. And, and so you'll see me, when we're appropriate, support those kinds of things. Two more questions on that. And, oh, okay. and I was going to say another uh, initiative. Uh, you're going to ask me two about more, two, more on a, two more initiatives. One, one is another tax. Um, it's likely that there may be a statewide bond measure for $11.1 billion to overhaul the state water system. Yes or no? That's another one. I'm not, I have not read all of the documents um, as to uh, what it is going to do. Uh, again, I go back to if we, if we have 10 things about taxing, everyone's going to just go no, 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 right. and no. Um, so um, I'm always one that says let's look at what our top priorities are. Uh, and what we can do this year. Uh, now we know that our infrastructure, um, not only in the state but on the city level, um, is crumbling. And you can be penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, but you have to be able for the public to have transparency about where it's going to go and accountability. Um, there's another initiative called the California Opportunity and Prosperity Act. And it's a little complicated, mm -hmm. so I'm actually going to read a little bit from their, what's circulating out there for the signature. It would decriminalize foreign workers without papers if they pay state taxes, know or are learning English, do not have felony convictions, or are suspected terrorists, are not a public charge, and have lived in California since before January 1st, 2008. Would you support something like that? 
I've supported the, you know, California Dream Act and yeah. the National Dream Act about those individuals who are studying and doing well and, you know, want again want to be here right. um, in the state of California in Los Angeles. Uh, so, again, um, you. This is like this is very similar to the the Dream, Dream Act. Act, but whereas the Dream Act just focused on students, this fo focuses on adults who are doing quote unquote everything that we would want them to do. As I, I think I said earlier, a path to citizenship um, is something that we should be focusing on nationally um, and other levels to ensure that um, those that are wanting to come here and be able to perform jobs that others necessarily are not. Um, you've seen in other states where they suddenly changed their, their policies on immigration and you saw businesses <coughs> close because mm -hmm. they said we didn't have the workers that we needed. Uh, mm -hmm. When you have 12 million people in the, in the United States um, that are working here, um, that are part of our economy, uh, you have to look at all sides of that issue and make right. sure that, um, again, that you're, you're looking at that path to citizenship. Right. I mean, obviously, if you become mayor of L.A., one-fifth of your uh, residents yes. are uh, undocumented immigrants uh, immediately. Uh, Occupy LA, the movement, what, what do you think about that? Well, they are a strong voice. Um, you know, they are 99%. You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that fit into that, that category. And I think they, uh, the, the movement was one that allowed people to express their frustration uh, and to say, uh, look at all the people who received bailouts, but our students who are still paying interest on their loans are not getting a bailout. I'm sure some of you in this room, you know, um, have student loans. Um, and here people had bailouts and our others didn't. So it was a movement that I think uh, we want to see uh, continue on to focus in on issues of e equality um, and ensure that we are, are focusing on the 99%. They destroyed the uh, city hall lawn. How much is it going to cost to fix that? I think it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars the last and, time. I and saw. I remember reading, uh, I think both uh, Steve Lopez or maybe Hector Tavar or somebody had this article where they had all kinds of landscapers call them up and said, hey, I'll do it for like mm -hmm. one fifth of that. You know, it's like, it's outrageous what it's going to be, what they're going to charge in terms of uh, refixing that lawn. And so, how, I mean, why is it that when city government or any government does something, it tends to cost more than if the private sector were to do it? Well, we're actually doing a, a, a small piece um, looking at uh, commodities in Los Angeles, how much we're paying mm -hmm. in the city, and could we have gotten better prices for our commodities. Uh, you have a preview. Uh, it's going to be coming out shortly, uh, an audit that we did and looking at those commodities. In the case of uh, Round City Hall, uh, part of the challenge was the infrastructure. Some of the sprinkler heads and all of the things that mm -hmm. were underground were damaged as well, not just the landscaping. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, there was a discussion as to maybe we need to, you know, be more uh, drought resistance and the kinds of things that we have there and so the design. Um, let me shift gears a little bit and talk about the City Council approved initial negotiations with a developer AEG for um, a football stadium that they would move the, uh, the convention center etc. Do, do you in general agree with the principle of what the council and the mayor are doing with uh, AEG and, and the football stadium? No, I um went to Raiders and Rams games growing up. Um, and I'd love to have a professional football team again in Los Angeles. I mean, yeah. if you're a UCLA fan, you have to go to a professional because otherwise oh. USC is always beating them, I know. So I can understand you missing football. Not always. Okay. I went to the Rose Bowl three times uh, when I was at UCLA, so um, when we were in the Rose Bowl. But yes, lately we've not had the same kind of team we had when I was growing up. But that being said, uh, we have seen economic growth and opportunity down uh, near Staples Arena. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a convention center that is woefully inadequate, uh, that has uh, infrastructure problems and challenges. And so I have been a, a supporter uh, with the following caveats. We need to deal with transportation, we need to deal with the impact in the surrounding communities, and we need to make sure that the city of Los Angeles is uh, not subsidizing that. Uh, those are three very important points uh, that I think they're addressing going forward. Um, they've adopted, the council and the mayor have adopted a conceptual agreement, mm -hmm. and we'll see as it goes forward, they make sure they address those problems. Yeah. I think or there, challenges, I would say. Uh, as, as far as I, I understand, they would say they would, they would meet all those. Yes. So, uh, and they're going to create an enormous amount of jobs. Right. Um, and in a time where we have, you know, the last number was about 12.5% in the L.A. County, uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're seeing a big change. In but our par part of it was having a shorter than normal EIR, environmental impact review. Are you in favor of doing that for major projects like a football stadium or something that uh, has 
a regional impact? Again, everything in Los Angeles, the state of California, takes longer than it should. Right. Um, and if there are ways that we can guarantee public input, public review, uh, and ensure that we can get a project up and running uh, in a shorter period of time, but have done, checked all the boxes to make sure we've done what we can, I'm all for that. Um, you know, we're at a university, and we're used to giving um, grades. And so I was going to ask you, using a traditional academic grading scale, how you would rate the following leaders. Um, President Barack Obama, A, B, C, D, fail? I, I'm, a, I'm a supporter uh, there, and I, I would say a, a B plus, um, only because of some of the challenges that uh, he has had to face in, in this country. Um, and, uh, but I think for, for me, um, you know, I, I'm certain he's, he's close to that A as well. Yeah. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown. I'd have to say that, that, you know, I think he's doing great things. He's, the nice thing about Jerry Brown is he's had experience. He is standing up for what's mm -hmm. important. Um, and uh, I haven't agreed with some of the things he's done on the CRA and mm -hmm. some of the other issues in the bills. Um, so I'd have to say incomplete, because he's only a year in. Yeah, but he's been, for, uh, been around forever. We have a good track record. Uh, Eight years said, previously as governor. Uh, I know, but you're saying is, you know, here in his current, you know. Okay. He, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. I have, have been asked that question before, and I've, I've usually answered similarly and complete uh, because he's... But he's almost done with this term. I know, done it's like, <laughs> and I think in that way... Seven, six, six and a half years. I'll, yeah. But we I think give, it is We should important. give him a grade right now. Yeah. Well, I don't know if all these students would be in their third quarter of their year if they want their grade or they want to wait till they get that last thing yeah, done. Yeah, you know, I, I could tell you what they're already getting right now. Actually, I could tell you like the first day of class, I size them up and I could always, <laughs> almost tell you who's going to get a... a an A or a B, so basically I don't even grade anymore. I just, you just, yeah, you know, yeah. right away? Yeah. Um, look, I, I, um, I think the mayor has been a, an incredible leader on the issue of transportation um, and yeah. pushing things. Uh, I saw him last night, we were talking about the fact that, you know, he feels uh, very strongly uh, about this is his time to push things through. He says, I'm not running for election, I'm focusing in on what's best for my city. And he says, in some ways, it is you know, it, it is very appealing to be mm -hmm. able to do that because I'm yeah. doing what I think is right without worrying about who's voting in this direction or another. Yeah, so. it's kind of weird. The New York Times wrote a great article about him last week. Uh, he just got named as chairman of the um, Democratic National Convention. He, he's had a he's had a good a good month. And he's focused in on you know trying to bring businesses here. We were here a, a couple of weeks ago with the Vice President of China and the Vice President of the United States okay. talking about how we have job creation and relationships there, um, making sure you know we're focusing on moderniz modernizing our uh, L LA airport. Uh, and you know, even though he was not successful in taking over the schools, mm -hmm. we will never have a time in the city of Los Angeles uh, where there isn't a discussion in a mayor's race right. about the educational system in Los Angeles and the role that it plays. And I was very lucky when I, even when I worked for Tom Bradley, we created a program called LA's Best. Right. That's still around. It's still around. It started at 10 schools. It's now at 180. But when we went to LAUSD, you know what their first, their first response was when we said, we want to pay for this whole program, we want to do an after school program? They said, no, thank you. Um, and we said, no is not the right answer, and we're going to push to do it. So I think that we've come to a place where people have understood there is a relationship between the schools and, um, and the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and I think the, the mayor has really pushed that forward. Um, and again, on the issue of, of public safety, um, through you know, much criticism, although I stood, I stood with him all of that, which was having a police force that was at the numbers we thought were important right. um, and that we had a priority for public safety. Um, so. So, so there's a lot of things, and I, again, I, I, I believe he's done a lot of good. Um, I do believe that Managing a city and looking at the, the basic delivery of services, there's been some challenges and we want to focus on that. Um, what do you think he's going to do afterwards, after he's mayor? So you, you, you get sworn in on July 1st. What does he do? Any I idea? He, well, I think, you know, he said he gets he to enjoy, do? I think he wants to enjoy life a little bit um, and uh, maybe do a little, you know, stint again in the private sector. Um, but I, I don't think his public service days are over. Yeah, you, but you don't have insight in terms I of what he's... I don't have any. He did not tell me last night, no. Okay. Maybe tomorrow um, he'll tell me. So night. we're still grading. You got one B plus and two incompletes. Hmm. Uh, LAPD Chief uh, Charlie Beck, what grade do you give him? 
A, B, C, D fail? This is why I don't like the grading system of that, you know, because I, do I, you know, but I have to do it at the have, end of the semester. You have to do it at the end yeah. of the semester. You need well, metrics. So you, I mean, you're a controller. You know, you have to have he's metrics. He's done a, a great job. And I think, again, if you um, uh, You said you would reappoint him. I would reappoint him. So, uh, so that's got to be at least a C, right? So let's oh, work no, up from there. Oh, no, he's above a C. Come on. Okay, so, um, hi, so higher, I than, would higher say, than Barack? You know, um, well, and I, I've got Excuse to reconsider me, I my... higher than the president. Yeah, I don't because I, I think I want to go back and when I look at all this, because I think I would give... Barack Obama an A minus and Chief Beck an A minus. Oh, you're changing a grade change. I am great change. Oh, she's like an Haven't easy grader. I argued for grade changes, didn't you? Sometimes you change mine, and if it goes up, particularly. Okay, so President A minus. I've never argued to go down. Police so. Chief an A minus. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, L.A. County Sheriff Lee Baca. Yeah. And I don't follow the share all the operational stuff, so I don't. I think that's harder for me because mm -hmm. I don't have the day to day. I think um, he definitely gets a A for effort and participation. I think he's had some challenges mm -hmm. right now, um, so um, I don't like grading. <laughs> Did you? Can you tell that? I'm actually. I don't have any more to ask, but I'm going to keep going just because uh, it's fun to see no, you. No, uh, you're at the end right here. Come on, uh, LAUSD. How do we? How do we grade your professor here? Well, they they do evaluations. <laughs> And besides, I'm tenured. It's, uh, LAUSD Superintendent John Daisy. Oh, it keeps going. Okay. Just one more. After. I would say his, look, again, an A for effort on him. He, he's new, so I, I, again, I would say I'm a little bit of the, the incomplete, but I have been impressed with everything that he has done. He's been willing to take on um, some really tough battles, um, and so I, I feel very positive about him. Okay, one more. LA City Council. Well, it's a as a as a body. Yeah, as a yeah. whole. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to say uh, a C. A C. Yes. Okay. Should I ask you about uh, Eric Garcetti and Jan Perry and a couple of others? I am focused on me. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Let's focus on you a little bit more. Um, how are? You, what's the strategy? How are you going to win this race? I mean, look. So the the election is in March 2013 like two and a half, three months after the presidential election. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to really pay attention um, between now and then. There'll be some forums, there'll be, you know, but in terms of really paying attention, I believe it'll happen immediately after the presidential election. Then we get into Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then you, it's, it's that sprint in January, February, and, and March. And there's, what's your strategy? Because no one's going to get 50%. And then the top two... Uh, um, vote getters then go into a primary election, excuse me, a, a, a general or runoff election in, in May. And what percent do you think the top two people will have? Well, the conventional wisdom uh, normally is that if you get the 24 to 26 percent, um, that you were in the runoff, okay. uh, depending upon the numbers. Um, and when I decided to run for the seat, I assumed everybody was in, mm -hmm. and I saw a path to winning this election. And it's about, as I've talked about, you know, it's about giving back and moving forward, about where we're gonna go in the future, and about learning from your experiences so that you can lead in the city of Los Angeles. People are hungry for that. Um, they're hungry for someone who can uh, make sure the, so to speak, the trains run on time, yeah. that you fix the problems that are here, and that is trustworthy, that is gonna be that fiscal watchdog, that's gonna make sure our fiscal house is in order. Um, and so, you know, I, I see um, that I am, I am different than all the others in my experiences inside and outside, my experiences of managing, of being a legislative and executive branch, um, and uh, the, the vision of where we want the city to go to be a livable city, uh, where it and is so a place as though where I grew up um, and felt like I had great opportunities. Okay, so let's assume that you get somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of the vote, and you're either the top vote getter or number two, and you get into the runoff. Where do you think that 25% is going to come from in terms of geographically first, then uh, ethnically, and then in terms of other uh, different uh, constituencies? So geographically, do you think most of your votes are going to come from the valley or citywide? Or no, citywide. I mean, I'm the only candidate who's run citywide. I got 65% of the vote when I ran. Uh, my highest percentage of votes and uh, numbers was in the... 8th, 9th, and 10th District, okay. Parks, Perry, and, and Weston's District. I did well in all over the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so I am fighting to make sure that I can get the votes uh, at every step of the way. 
Um, clearly, the Valley is an important part mm -hmm. of the election. You can look back at Tom Bradley's first election that he lost yep. and the one that he won four years later. The difference there was the Valley. When you look at Dick Reardon, mm -hmm. he carried the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> when you look at uh, Jimmy Hahn and Antonio, first time, they carried the Valley. Um, and the second time, Antonio carried the Valley. Yeah. So it's 40% of the electorate. Of course, um, I, born and raised, live, represented that area, and uh, have been working hard as their city controller. Is the valley really different? Is it different than the rest of the city? They have the same. No, I, I don't think so at all. Um, and I, I think that um, it is a very diverse area. As you may recall, I ran my first race <coughs> for city council member in a district that was 49% Latino. Right. Um, and a lot of people didn't think I could win that race. And right. I did by 225 votes. Well, you, you beat a Latino legislator who was running at that Correct. time. Correct. Yeah. And I think that... Um, I don't care where you are in the city of LA, and I've gone to every part of the city, from San Pedro, Watts, South LA, East LA, you know, and Boyle Heights, Highland Park, um, the Silmar, Pacoima, you know, West Valley, Canoga Park, Chatsworth, and the West Side. Mm -hmm. The issues are still the same. So I want a job. I want to have a good education for my kids. I it. want them to have an opportunity that's greater than, than me, and I don't want to spend all my time in traffic, and I want to feel safe in my neighborhoods. Those, no matter whether your income is at the lower level or the higher level, it is important. And so I think if you are a, an individual who's running for mayor, um, the message is very clear. They just want to get the job done, and they want someone who's going to lead. So you're running. Councilwoman Jan Perry's running. Councilmember Eric Garcetti's running. Uh, Austin Butner, former deputy mayor and investment banker, Kevin James, radio personality, and S County Supervisor Seb Yaroslavsky may run. Um, so who do you think is going to come in second? I just know I'm coming in first, so who, I don't, do you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think is going to come in second? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a, you know. Who do, who do you want to come in second? I, I, I would hesitate to, to say that. I mean, I think I can beat all of them, um, again, by, see, right? By doing my job, um, by being a good controller mm -hmm. and having the vision, which I, I've outlined about what we want to see the city look like. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not going to go down that path of who I want to see because I feel confident in all of this. Um, let me ask you, I personally am very concerned about the lack of women in LA city politics. There, there are 15 council members. There's only one woman. And then there are 18 elected officials in the city because the 15 council members, city controller, mayor, and city attorney. So you and Jan Perry are the only two women elected in, in city council. Just, you know, six, eight, ten years ago, um, there were like five or six women on the LA city council. What is happening? Why? And, and I would even further go that, um, that it's not likely that any other council districts are going to elect a, a woman if you take a look at who's running, with a possible exception of maybe the ninth, because I don't know who's really emerging there. But when you take a look at which districts are opening up and who's the favorite, the top one or two individuals, we may end up with a city council of no women for the first time since 1953. I mean, um, why are there so few women on the LA City Council? What is happening? When I got elected, there were five of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm only the second woman in the history of the city to be a citywide elected office holder. Um, and you're correct, we potentially could have no women. Uh, when you look uh, nationally and the state and locally, we see diminishing numbers of women. We are 50. 6%, I think it's 56% of the, the votes um, in, the, in the country, and yet we're 17% of the Congress. And I see a lot of women in this, in this room mm -hmm. um, who probably have not been encouraged to run for office. Here's the challenges that a woman has. One, uh, it's hard to raise money. Women do a different way in which they raise money. They, two, when they run for office now, and why, they- let me stop you there. Why is it more difficult for a woman to raise money than a, a male candidate? Uh, well, a couple things. One is you would normally go you're to like the, you're raising more money than just about anybody. Correct, um, but it's not without a lot of you know having a call on the phone. I like to tease. There are two different ways in which a, a man <coughs> and a, a woman raise money. A guy calls Joe and says, "Joe, I need five thousand dollars by Friday. Can you get it for me?" And or, no, or when can I pick it up? When can yeah. I pick it up? 
the woman goes, well, Joe, how's your family? How you doing? You know, may, do you think maybe you could raise 5,000? And you know, whenever you can get it is just fine. Very different approach. Now, we're all learning how to do it differently. So I'm not saying that it's not possible. But if you look at um, historically, it's been harder. Because women also don't give the same amount. I've gone to a law firm, and I've had partner, 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 all of them, and, and a couple women and men. The men give more than the women. It's a very different approach to things. If you may recall, um, Ann Richards, who was an incredible governor from Texas, yes. used to say to the women, I know you don't like to give, but just give whatever it costs you to get your outfit. What does your shoes cost and your suit and your jewelry, whatever it is. Whatever you're wearing that day. Whatever you're wearing that day, that's what I want you to contribute. Um, and so I think it is also um, the fact that uh, women uh, still um, People uh, do have, there's discrimination about, you know, can you be a good mother and be a good elected official? Can you do both? Uh, and I know, for me, I didn't even think about that, but have been surprised that I have hit walls on numerous occasions where people still had that belief of whether or not you could do both of those things. And I think the last part of it is women don't always help women generally. There's a famous quote by Madeleine Albright. <coughs> that says there's a special place in hell for women who don't help women. Hmm. And some of my friends say, ooh, there's a lot of women, you know, there. Um, and <laughs> I think it is important that um, we do support one another. But the, the guys will have a whole, you know, using a sports analogy, there's a bench, you know, and they're creating that bench, and they're supporting one another, and they're helping each other get to that next level of being able to get elected. Women need to do a better job of that. But then, it, it, with that being in mind, why haven't the women that left the city council, including yourself, helped recruit the next council member in terms of who they should, the, who should run? And kind of say, hey, the, the, I know I'm going to run for city controller or whatever you're going to run for. Let me start thinking about recruiting uh, uh, a couple of female candidates to seriously think about. Did you go through that process? Yeah, I did. And, and you know, there was a uh, you know, woman who ran for my seat mm -hmm. who, who didn't win. Um, I supported her um, and had been a, a longtime friend. Uh, but I think there is a wake-up call that is happening right now, uh, and that there's a lot more discussion. We have only had one, one Latina on the city council in our history. Yeah. One. Um, I sat last week with a number of, of young women at, at Hope, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is helping uh, Latinas on a number of levels. Um, and once again said, we have to do more. And one young woman said, you know, I heard you last year because I'd been there the year before. She said, after I left here and you told me I could do whatever I, I wanted to and I should pursue it and we needed more women, she goes, I ran and I won and I'm a city council member. Oh. And so that's what we have to do is mentor and be good role models and tell people that's willing to do and to help them. And yes, help them raise money and do that. Yeah. So for those Latinas who are out there, HOPE stands for Hispanas Organized for Political Empowerment. You check out their website, they have training sessions, they'll train you how to get on commissions and how to get politically involved and ultimately how to run for political office. office. So I hi highly encourage uh, Latinas to go and, and, uh, and, and do that. Um, I'm gonna ask students who want a good grade to come up here and, <laughs> and ask uh, questions. All the professors that are here are, are paying attention in terms of who is uh, asking questions. And um, so we welcome you to come up here. And as you make your way, and I know don't hurt people as you get uh, climb over people to come over here to uh, 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 ask some questions. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Um, redistrict yeah, redistricting. Um, it's never a pretty process. It's always redrawn these lines. I would have completely uh, have drawn them differently. Um, what's the solution to how it unfolded in, in, in LA? And by the way, it's not done. The commission did its part and has given it to the city council and the city council is currently reviewing it and they have not voted on it. But you had an appointee to that commission. Um, who did you appoint? What direction did you give them? How did that all work out? Well, there's um, probably nothing, nothing more political than redistricting <coughs> because it determines your future, particularly if you're a sitting elected official, whether you can get reelected or what kinds of icons you're going to have in your uh, area and the kinds of issues that you're going to deal with. Um, so I think that that first and foremost, it is a political process. Uh, I appointed a, a woman by the name of Helen Kim, a, a lawyer um, at a, a firm here. 
very much uh, was someone who was an advocate for um, the Asian American community and making sure that there was representation. Um, my advice to her uh, was be truthful, be transparent, uh, you know, know how to make a deal when you need to and ha be negotiating mm -hmm. consensus. Um, I, I did not instruct her one way or another to vote one way. I just said, I want you to be somebody that um, people say she listened um, and made the decision based on the facts before me. I was watching the, the whole process uh, just because I guess I get paid to do that as a professor of political science. And the initial community, um, uh, the, the community meetings, they were sparsely attended. But as soon as the maps came out and they moved Westchester completely out of here, all of a sudden from 21 people showing up in Mar Vista to over 800 people showing up later on. But then as soon as that issue was gone and they put Westchester back into the 11th district, very little uh, uh, turnout. How, is there any way we can outreach and get more people involved in the process at the beginning? I think we should start earlier and maybe having even the maps earlier. I think mm -hmm. that would be a, a good idea. Again, when you're talking about it in vague terms, most people um, don't really understand, don't, most don't even know who their elected officials right. are. Uh, so it is usually a smaller percentage of the population that are focused on that. And when they see the maps, then that's a call to action uh, yeah. to do that. But I think starting earlier, uh, maybe having some principles about what it is, and, and they did that a bit, but yeah, but um, they could have done discussion. a much better job on that. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's my proposal. I would take a straight line and draw 15 districts horizontally, just uh, and say that's the first map. And that would draw everybody out and change all the districts and say, if people don't come and talk, that's going to be the districts. And that would get, because all of a sudden, everybody would be annoyed. Yeah. And it would all, all change. So that's how you would get uh, participation from the very beginning. Draw the goofiest lines. Right. You can. Actually, it wouldn't be goofy. There'd be a straight line, 1 15th of the city, just going down from north to south. And, and I think that, that, that would uh, uh, take care of that. I'm going to take some uh, uh, questions. Okay. I was wondering if you could speak to any projects that you've worked with State Controller John Chung on and the importance that Los Angeles collaborating on the state level with our elected officials holds. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of John Chung's. Um, he is one of those individuals who have stood up for the right things um, in the state. Uh, hasn't always uh, made his, him friends, um, but it has been. I think people know he's coming from the heart. Uh, John and I worked uh, closely on a couple of things. One is I was the first to put on our website um, all of the salaries of city employees um, in uh, light of the Bell scandal to ensure that we were transparent about how much people were making. Uh, John and I talked a lot about that. He similarly put that on his website. Uh, secondly, we've been uh, working uh, closely as well uh, with the um, uh, housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, excuse me, not the Housing Authority, the LA Community College District, um, and uh, some of the issues that he's looked at in that area. And so we've, we've tried where possible uh, to coordinate. We looked also at the Community Redevelopment Agency. He was doing an audit, we, we did um, as well. So I think that the more that elected officials can work together, um, the better it is. John Chung is the state controller. So it holds a very similar position to yours, although there's some differences. But it's so it, it uh, just wanted to make sure the students knew who John Chung was. Next. Hi, my name's Spencer. I'm also an urban studies major. And I was wondering what your stance is, especially as city controller, um, how you feel about um, like the leaders in emergency services and the issues um, specifically concerning double dipping for some. Uh, and how you would possibly solve it. it, it further than that, it, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, two things. There, there is a pension time bomb for the city of LA. It has its own retirement system. It doesn't go through CalPERS, number one. And number two, um, the city is, is thinking about, they had negotiated certain agreements with its employees' unions and said, hey, we're gonna put off your raise for the next two years. Well, that's done, and now it's coming due, and the city's saying, ah, uh, we said we were gonna give you a raise in two years, but we wanna take that back because we don't have the money. Um, how you gonna, I mean, and a lot of things are gonna come due on July 1st, right, when 
you become mayor. It's, it's going to be really, really tough uh, budget environment. Um, and I still want the job. And you still want so the job. You know. Okay. Um, look, it, you know, a lot of the challenges that we're facing now um, with pensions and others are decisions that were made 20 years ago right. where they said, we don't have enough money to, to give you a cost of living adjustment. We're going to just increase your pensions. Um, and now that's coming to roost, so to speak, right. and that we're having to do that. Um, I'm a big believer in sitting down with uh, labor unions in the city and being uh, in, a, in a way that says, here's our problem, how do we solve it together? Um, and I have felt in, in many instances where uh, the leadership has come in, the union leadership has said, hey, we have some ideas, here's how we can save some money. I've identified $125 million of things that we could save money in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and so there is a, a willingness to do that, but they also want to be treated fairly. Oftentimes they would come to me and say, Wendy, I want to make sure that these numbers are right. Could you just share with us what you know? Because mm -hmm. we know you're going to be honest and fair with us on where it is. Um, I think with uh, the, the pension and the, and the double dipping and some of the other areas where um, there's some concern, I think those are topics that um, have been brushed under the table before and need to, need to be discussed. Um, we are at a different time than we have been uh, before. Uh, but there are some obligations that people have made in, in the past um, that the city is required to, to keep going forward. Um, so one of the issues that I've talked about has been uh, bankable hours, overtime hours, uh, that we have this liability. And it goes back to, and I've broken record about this, accountability and transparency. A decision that they made said that the city council mayor did said, okay, we're going to have uh, not normally 96 hours of allowable banked overtime. So that means if you, you know, had a, a week that you had to work a lot more overtime, you could bank up to 96 hours and we don't have to pay you um, right away for that 96 hours. And you just hold it for a while. And you then... hold it and then, you know, maybe next week you decide to take a couple days off and that, that works and that reduces it below that. Uh, but what they did is allowed it up to 800 hours. Um, and, and if you don't use it, it has to be paid. It has to be paid out. Uh, it has to be paid out. And okay. what would happen if all of that obligation... Um, <coughs> came uh, at you know, the end of 2014 that you had to pay for that. Um, we think, I think, I think it's important that you have that on your balance sheet or your, at least in the budget right. Right. that says, here's this liability, just remember, unless you manage it. And I've talked to the chief about it um, and said to him, I know you're a great manager, but what happens if we have a huge disaster or we have uh, some uh, big kind of um, uh, event that causes the police to have to have a lot more overtime, it's going to be hard for you to let police officers have two months off uh, mm -hmm. to be able to get the numbers down. So we just have to be transparent as we're having that dialogue and discussion as to uh, where we are uh, specifically on, on those kinds of issues and pensions and other stuff. And the city cannot unilaterally say we're not going to count those overtime hours anymore, or you have to take them as overtime, not in terms of cash, because it's a contract, and by law, you have to meet that obligation. So we've, in a sense, painted ourselves into a corner where we have this obligation, and there's nothing we can do about it. Correct. Again, the hope would be that you could manage it down mm -hmm. in that way, and that you don't get over a certain number of hours, and the chief, I know, is working really hard to do that. I just want to make sure that a light is, is shown to say, where is it when we start getting down a path uh, where there's no return and you will have to make a big mm -hmm. payout at, at some point in time? Uh, let's just put out what the numbers are necessarily. Um, and I think that's important, whether it be pensions or double dipping or how much people get. I mean, that's why we did the whole thing in the, in the bell, in light of the bell scandal. Let's be transparent about how much people make and where that is. And yeah, we found, and there were some, you know, we've done some studies where uh, there was uh, one instance uh, where we were working with the fire department and we saw that this one person had had a half a year of vacation. How does that work? How do you do that? Um, and so I think uh, it is important to be transparent. Yeah, nobody but professors should have half a year of vacation. It's like, um, but you know, I don't want to leave the impression with the students or the audience that, that, uh, the, that most government uh, employees are like former city manager Rizzo or others right. where we talk about them having over 100,000, 175,000. The average uh, government employee currently on a pension is only getting about between 30 to $35,000 a year. And so it's not in, you know, the vast, vast majority are at that level, not this hundreds of thousands of, uh, of dollars. So, yeah. And you can go onto my website and you could see 
you what know, is your the website? Controller. Uh, WendyGrill.com? That's the other uh, website. That's the, the political side of the website. But the city, can, you can go to controller. Um, we can talk LA about city. your political Don't website. We're not at City Hall. <laughs> so, it, your, so your campaign website is WendyGrill.org. WendyGrill.org. But the city controller's website is? Uh, controller at LACity.org. Controller LACity.org. All right. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Giovanni Falcon, political science major. Um, my question is, when you do become mayor, thank you. <laughs> um, what will you do differently than Antonio Villaraigosa? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think as I expressed uh, earlier, um, one of my um, skills um, and experience is about uh, managing uh, the city. It's about making sure that. Uh, we are spending our dollars wisely and effectively. I think it is, uh, from my perspective, that we can do a better job of how we're managing um, in each of our departments. We've had a lot of challenges, and it's the tone at the top and being able to, to look at that. Um, I think the difference that I have is I'm going to make sure that as the taxpayer's watchdog and then most knowledgeable on the budget and some of the challenges that we have and how the departments are operating, uh, that I'm going to hold each of those general managers accountable. I'm going to have benchmarks and I'm going to say, if you're not doing what you need to do, here are the consequences of, of how can, we do you it. You can fire general managers now, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, uh, as I indicated earlier, the, the mayor's done some extraordinary things. Um, and I just want to make sure that as we go forward, when we're crossroads of where we want to go, I don't want to look backwards, I want to look forwards. And, uh, and looking forward means um, how do we make sure we get that transportation system uh, that he's been successful in getting us some dollars to do that it actually gets built. How do I ensure that we talk a lot about being business friendly, that the departments that are responsible for ensuring that we're business friendly, that are actually doing the job that they were important to. And how do I make sure that in a partnership with the LAUSD that our schools are not failing and that our kids are graduating um, from uh, a, a high school, it doesn't matter where you live in the city of Los Angeles, that you'll be able to do that. So I like to look forward and to say I'm going to build on the past uh, and uh, be able to ensure that this great city that we have is a, is a city that we can all be, be proud of. What are the Mayor Viragosa's strengths? I think he's done a, a again, I, I've talked about transportation. No, I don't mean policy because I think you're right about transportation, but his strengths as, as mayor in terms of the skills or, or, or from a personal perspective, what are, what are his? I think that when, when uh, particularly when he was elected and, and when <clears throat> he was uh, going across the city, there's a sense of excitement mm -hmm. about um, a vision for where Los Angeles is going to go, um, that he could uh, electrify a group of people saying, we can do this together. Um, and similarly, that's occurred on a state and national level. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the job of the mayor is to use this bully pulpit to bring more resources. Right. Um, I've never had a problem when he goes to Sacramento or Washington and bring us more money. Right. That's what we need to do because uh, we're not going to be able to solve it uh, alone together. So I think that um, he has represented the important parts of the diversity of Los Angeles um, that we want to see in the future. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, you mentioned the importance of uh, education throughout your whole thing about like jobs and all that. I'm just curious, you mentioned a few things, but what else would you do to improve education um, besides the couple things you mentioned? So the, the question about education, I just want to kind of uh, give parameters that the mayor of Los Angeles has absolutely no control over public education. They don't fire, they don't hire, they don't vote, they do nothing, they don't control the budget. They have no control over LAUSD. So how are you gonna fix education? <laughs> With that caveat, mm -hmm. um, I think it is, uh, I, I always say, you know, we need to keep all of our options open. Uh, we need to look at everything from how do we, uh, I guess I'd say blow up the bureaucracy mm -hmm. in a way, yeah. uh, which says, you know, let's not have so much top up here, let's have it down in a local school. I mean, my, my son goes to, to public school, local, so I've learned firsthand. LAUSD. LAUSD, where some of the, the challenges are, um, and the fact that we actually have to do it from the grassroots up. My school that my son goes to went from a 650 API to a 910, unheard of. Right. It was still a Title I school, which meant 40% of the kids were eligible for free lunch. This was not 
you know, in a wealthy part of this, you know, city that here our numbers just went great and we no longer have um, the diversity that's so important um, to, to Los Angeles. It means um, demanding high quality uh, teachers and holding them accountable and, and giving them also the tools to ensure that they can succeed. Yeah. But don't you have to be careful in terms of the campaign about promising too much about education when you know you can't do any of it? I mean, I remember having um, former Mayor uh, James Hahn come to uh, this forum uh, like about three months after he had lost the election to um, Antonio Villaraigosa. And he said his number one mistake was that people would start talking to him about education. And then he would respond, well, the mayor has no responsibility. He'd give him the formal response. And, and that he soon realized that people were thinking that he was ducking the question. People believe that the mayor can do something about education. But the reality is he can't, or she can't. You know? And so, it, so you, you have a two-edged sword. When people are going to ask you those questions throughout the campaign, and, and they want you to give an answer, and if you start telling them, I have no control over it, they're like, oh, what the heck? Why would I vote for her? Yet, you don't want to give an answer that you know there's no, nothing you can do. Well, I mean, you're right. Uh, and, and look, if you asked most parents today who their school board member was, they wouldn't be able to tell you because they don't know. They don't know necessarily unless they are critically actively involved. Right. And, you know, well, but look, um, I go back to it. If you are mayor of the city of Los Angeles, you can never go back and say you don't have a role in the schools. Correct. And, you know, Antonio Viragosa has his partnership schools. Um, so there are ways in which you can influence. It's just the same question you asked earlier about how do you, with a weak mayor, strong council, you could say, ah, oh, that's the council, I can't do anything about it. That's not the right answer. Um, the right answer is I'm going to focus in on changing the behaviors and being, a, you know, being a in some ways a thorn in their side about what I think is important. But the only way we're going to change the schools, the only way we're going to change the schools is by greater parental involvement, greater resources. We cannot be 48th in the country on per pupil spending. Making sure that we uh, provide um, the, the training necessary and the focus on good teachers and holding them accountable. And if they're not performing and we've done all we can, then we have to fish or cut bait on those instances. And it means principles, focusing on our principles. How we went from a 650 to a 910 is we had a principal who came in and said, I'm going to hold teachers, parents, and kids accountable, and I'm going to bring resources <coughs> to bear to the school. So um, there is no magic bullet. If we'd had one, guess what? It would have happened. But it, you go back to our initiatives yeah. that you are talking about earlier and the voters. We have to be able to say to the voters, if we encourage you to vote for this, the money's going to go to ensure that we do better at each of these schools, and here's exactly how we do it. Um, but um, I think it's a cop-out to say we can't do anything, the mayor can't do anything. Um, and uh, we're going to have to continue to, to fight that fight and to be partners. Um, you know, I've met with John Daisy on numerous occasions, and I'm just the city controller. We've talked about how the controller can be helpful uh, mm -hmm. to the school district. He meets, meets regularly uh, with the mayor and some of the, you know, I think some council members who have particular challenges in their neighborhoods. It is too important to put it for chance that it's someone else's problem. But uh, it means you have to use your skills um, mm -hmm. and building consensus and pounding the table sometime to say that education is number one and I'm going to use my, my uh, political capital to do something about it. So um, you mentioned something, the mayor's schools or that partnership, which I hadn't thought about. So does, does the next mayor step into that position or was that unique to, uh, how would that work? Well, it, it is a nonprofit that's kind of been set up too to operate those schools, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that. And the nonprofit um, reports to who? It, it's partly the mayor and a board, and you know, there's a whole lot of, of opportunities there, and there's fi there's funding that's money that's been funding it mm -hmm. um, that will continue to go on, um, and I think we take best practices and and look at all kinds of ways in which you can make sure our schools are successful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Earlier you, meant, you had mentioned that one of the number one challenges is being a woman running was how to raise money. I was just curious what some of your other challenges challenges are and if you see being a female candidate as an advantage or as a disadvantage. You know, um, 
women have not done well in winning executive office in California. So Diane Feinstein ran for governor and lost. Kathleen Brown ran for governor and lost. Then Diane Feinstein turns around and wins U.S. Senate legislative position really easy and gets reelected. Um, there's really been no strong candidate that's ever run for, female candidate that's run for LA. Maybe Linda Grego in 1993, but even she polled barely double digits. Um, so it, it's, it's tough enough for women running for public office. For the executive, it's even doubly tough. So um, one, I think for me, different than, than others that may have run before, and, and Linda Grego, because we recently sat down together, she got in very late. I think if she'd yeah. gotten in earlier in the race, uh, she might have been able to, to pull that off at, at the time. Uh, but By the way, she had a great commercial. She had a fabulous commercial. Yeah. For those yeah, that didn't see it, it was a cardboard cutouts of all of the guys, and they all were in gray. Kind they're of. all gray, yeah. And she walked through it in a red suit um, and showed, you know, this is something different. I can't yeah. remember the words that she used. It didn't matter. It was, the image was It was, was very awesome. effective. It was yeah. very, very effective in the image. Um, and so I'm, the, you know, as I said earlier, I'm the only uh, candidate running for this office, number one, that's had an executive position and one mm. citywide. And the controller, which is fiscally responsible uh, position, the taxpayers watched up. Uh, but to answer your question, um, look, when I decided to run for office, I was 40 and single. My mother said to me if I ran, I would never get married or have children, and that she would support me even if that was the case, that I was not going to give her a grandchild. Uh, two weeks later, I met my now husband, and it, you know, it was, uh, I followed my dream about what I wanted to be able to do. Um, and Sounded like this, a campaign promise, and you fulfilled it. I did. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know, my son is now eight and a half years old, and on my on my wedding day in the, the Daily News, it said, "Gruel proves mom wrong." It was a great headline uh, to be able to say that. But there are extreme. There are big challenges. I'm only the third woman in the history to have a child while in office, um, and the first was. I'm going to test you. See, I get to ask him questions. See if he passes. I'm going to give him a grade. Yvonne Braithaway Burke. No. Fail. F. No, okay. she's, <laughs> she's the... Uh, she is the first congresswoman oh, correct. to have a child. But who was the first woman in the city? Oh, uh, Rosalind Wyman. Okay, all right. Shoot. Okay, second. Who was second. the second woman? Second woman. I can't believe you don't know this. I left. I, I, Pat Russell? No, Pat, no, no. Gloria Molina. Oh, Gloria Molina, that's yes, right. She was, uh, yes. yes. So that Gloria was. <laughs> I knew that, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> so you all can grade him on that one. Yeah. Um, 50%, uh, I'm doing better than most of my <laughs> students. <laughs> oh, oh. Not after tonight, come on. Yeah. Um, and Gloria was 25 years ago. and. I thought, you know, I just thought I was lucky I was going to have my son at 42 years old and, wow, well, wasn't that great. Little did I realize that there were still a lot of um, discrimination about uh, whether or not um, you could do two jobs. I've gotten asked everything uh, from, you know, were, are you going to quit your job when I was announced that I was pregnant? And I said, no, I worked really hard to get elected. Uh, I'd only been in office uh, nine months uh, when I um, uh, had to, uh, when I announced that I was having my son. Uh, and, you know, the other is, on a constant basis, you know, how can you be a good elected official and be a good mom? If I didn't come back to work soon enough after having my child, I wouldn't have been a good council member. If I came back too soon, I wasn't a good parent. Right. Uh, and those are things that um, it's hard to even know exist. So I think there's a lot of women who say, wow, how am I going to be able to do this? And one of the most rewarding moments of, of my career has been the women who have come up to me and said, thank you. Thank you for being a role model. Thank you for ensuring that you actually can be uh, a, a good mom and a, a good elected official. Uh, don't ask my son on some of those days where I, you know, give him a time out or something. But so, although he, he's good, he, I don't need to do that uh, with him. But I, I think that we have a lot um, of, of room for improvement for accepting that uh, women uh, can uh, be in elective office and do other things. Um, we're multitaskers. Um, we can do a lot more, sorry, um, but, uh, than, than others in being able to balance. I do get asked the question a lot, how do you balance all of this? 
And I said, if I told you I did, I would be lying to you. I balance some days, and some days I don't. And it's just like, you know, some days I'm working really hard and I, I don't get to do everything I'd like to do as a part of my family, and then other days I can, you know, make it and kind of ensure that this happens. But most importantly, it's uh, being a role model for my child and a role model for the city, um, and people not saying when I run for office, well, I'm going to vote for her just because she's the woman. I want them to vote for me because I'm the qualified candidate who's going to lead the city. And oh, by the way, she's also a woman. And how great it would be to have the first woman mayor of the second largest city in the country be a woman. Okay. Well, with that, uh, Wendy Grohl, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.